Okay, so let's turn to Michelle. Good morning, Michelle. It's still morning. Um, and we're going to be looking at H195. Uh, I know, Michelle, you sent you sent us something. Hopefully it's posted. Or is it in the email? I'm not sure. But the... Uh... Right, I just... Um, I wanted to give you the act from last year that the that h195 referenced so we could just take a look at that language so it's in your email i wasn't gonna the bill is so short i wasn't gonna share the screen so i didn't set yeah. it up but hopefully that's okay um and just a little caveat is i uh i don't really have any background on facial recognition technology so i just wanted to let you know that up front um so this is a new topic that uh, just came to me. And um, so I'll walk you through, I'll, uh, it's not even really a walkthrough. We're just gonna take a glance at this very short bill and then I'll, I'll show you the act that it's, uh, it's a, making an exception to. So we're looking at the bills introduced for H-195 and what it's essentially doing is creating an exception to an existing, existing moratorium on the use of facial recognition technology by law enforcement. And so if you go to either, I don't know if Evan's posted it yet, either that or I emailed you all a copy or if people are following along on YouTube, it's um, Act uh, 166 from last year. Uh, and it's section 14, uh, where it has the moratorium. And so you'll see in the language there, uh, it says that the, until the use of facial recognition technology by law enforcement officers is authorized by an enactment of the General Assembly, law enforcement officers shall not use facial recognition technology or information acquired through that technology unless the use would be permitted with respect to drones under a specific statute that you have in Title 20 on law enforcement use of drones. And then it goes through and it just identifies that it uh, defines what facial recognition means and facial recognition technology. And so what you have in H-195 is, is doing just that, where you're sp the General Assembly would be specifically authorizing the use of that technology uh, but only in certain types of investigations. Um, and so you'll see there the, the ones that are listed. The first one you're obviously really familiar with because we've just been working in that chapter. And so that's chapter 64 of Title 13 relating to sexual exploitation of children. Another chapter is the sexual assault chapter. Um, you also have homicide and kidnapping. So, um, so those, so it could only be used in investigation of those types of those crimes and where law enforcement's in possession of an image of an individual they believe to be a victim, a potential victim or a suspect in the investigation of one of those crimes. And the search is solely confined to uh, locating images including videos of that individual within electronic media legally seized by law enforcement as part of that specific investigation. So this proposal came from the Attorney General's office. So I'm happy to answer questions if you have them for me, but I'm guessing most of them are probably most appropriate from the age for the AG's representatives, but. Tom. Thank you. Uh, and this may be for the AG's office, Michelle. Um, and I'm just wondering where uh, sexual assault, homicide, and kidnapping came from. And, and because when, when I did talk to the AG's office uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about sexual exploit, exploitation of children only. And, and so I didn't know if you had any insight on where uh, this other stuff came from because uh, to me that's that's way out of line uh, compared to what I would ever want to do. But um. no, I got a proposal. I wrote it up, and there you have it. <laughs> that, that's that was my guess. <laughs> so uh, usually I'm a little more involved in the back and forth and all stuff, but this one, um, no, I think you have to speak to David and and okay. Matt about that. Thank you. Anybody else? Nope. All right, great. I'll be here. <laughs> All right, yeah, thank you. Okay, great. So then why don't we turn to uh, Matt Raymond and, and David Scher from the Attorney General's Office. I'm not sure who wants to uh, testify first, but could help us 
understand the um, the need for for this bill from from your office's standpoint. Sure, I'd invite uh, Commander Raymond to go ahead if if he doesn't mind. Great, thank you. Yeah, um, not a problem. So <clears throat> when this um, moratorium passed, we had been using uh, facial detection and facial recognition as part of our forensic tools for quite a long time now. Um, and this uh, became a problem uh, for us right away. Um, so uh, in the child uh, sexual exploitation realm, if we have um, a known victim or a suspected victim um, and we have seized devices from an individual and now we want to look for that victim on the devices an easy way to do that is use facial detection to run it across so we're not using it in the standard sense where um you're trying to identify a person by you know scraping images from the internet that's not what we're doing we have legally seized media and we're confining our search just to that legally seized media to try to identify the images um, uh, of sexual exploitation of this child across the device. Um, and that's something, so just uh, maybe to back up a little bit so everybody's on the same page um, to just explain, there's facial detection, which um, can be done by just a program saying, is there a human face in this, in this data? Um, and that's not identifying a certain person, uh, but it's just identifying a, a human face. And then there's facial recognition. And that's the piece uh, that is using biometric data on a particular face to identify a particular human being. Um, and in this case, what we're just asking permission for is on, sorry, that's my dog snoring in the background. If, I apologize for that. Um, uh, we're just asking permission to be able to examine the, the data that we've already seized legally um, and to use the forensic tools that we've are always been using for this to continue to be able to do that by using the facial recognition part of those tools. Um, and one of the questions that was asked was, why was that expanded past child exploitation? So I can give two uh, quick examples. Um, we had, um, uh, two different cases. One, one case was a person that was originally, um, we had arrested him for uh, trading images of sexual exploitation of infants and toddlers on Kick, a messenger service. And then when we went through his data, we actually uh, found that he had um, been raping his uh, two-year-old uh, toddler himself. And then we use the face of that uh, toddler to search across the data to get the rest of the images. And what, what that did was change it from um, a, a sexual assault of a child to aggravated sexual assault of a child. That changed it to a potential life imprisonment case. So if we limit it to just uh, child exploitation, then where do you dice that up? Once we were searching for additional images, it's now really a sexual assault investigation. Um, it's also a child exploitation investigation. Um, and then in another case, we had um, a person that we actually um, had, um, had downloaded videos from directly. Um, and uh, in a proactive case that we had done, we went and did a search warrant on his place and through his device and then examination uh, of of that information, we actually found that he was um, sending money, thousands of dollars overseas for the torture of children, uh, for the kidnapping and murder of a person by suffocation. Um, and so now we're into a homicide investigation um, uh, across countries. So limiting it just to child exploitation becomes problematic when we're, when we're sifting through this data. And again, we're not asking to do the the controversial step of, of uh, facial detection is going out and trying to identify somebody, you know, by scraping images off the internet. We're, we're not doing any of that. It's just legally seized data. And it's really just a filter in our forensic tool to be able to identify uh, victims uh, in these cases. Mm, okay, thank you. I see uh, Barbara and then Tom. Um, thank you for 
explaining that technology um, difference. So when you're scraping, um, I, I, I don't know, I have the, I want to use a different word. When you're taking, this is all property that has been voluntarily given to you or a, obtained through a warrant. Is that right? Correct. This would be either seized pursuant to a state warrant or uh, consent from the individual. So once you have that, you're, you're not like looking up who their Facebook friends are and correspondence that they're having to lure other people or? That, that's just data that's uh, confined to the device. So um, an example is if you're, if you're using your mobile device to get on Facebook, none of that data on, fa on your Facebook app is actually stored locally on your phone. That's all stored on Facebook servers. So we, we can't even right. see that information when we're looking at the data that's just stored on the phone. So you're going through the data stored on the phone for looking for human faces. Well, it, in particular, it depends on the case, right? But okay. If, okay. If, right. If somebody, um, you know, we have, somebody's trading child pornography has a child of that same age and gender, um, then obviously searching that four images of that child on their device is of utmost importance to be able to identify it if that, if that child's a victim or not. And let's say you can't identify who the child is. You don't run it against something else to try to figure it out or run the parent by something else, like through your own? Yeah, we don't use, we don't use anything like the Clearview AI or anything like that where there is, um, and, and clearly that would not be allowed by the way this bill is written either. Um, but, but no, we don't do that. What we do do is nationally, um, all the ICACs work together to collectively try to identify these victims. And that's not running it across um, you know, any, any data scrapings or anything like that. It's lo looking at the images. Um, if we have an unknown victim, is there anything in the image that we can use to locate like the, the geographically where they're located, like uh, uh, trees in the picture, rocks that are located- Skyscrapers, in right, yeah. Yeah, right. exactly, like something that would identify the people and then we share that uh, through all 61 ICACs and try to, because somebody may have, there may be a series of images traded on this one child. Right. And, you know, I may have one piece of the puzzle. Indiana could have the other piece of the puzzle. Sure. And then if we, um, you know, combine forces, then we can locate that child and rescue them. And there's thousands of uh, success stories of that nationwide. That's awesome. Well, and where does the, where does this, like, the child? I mean, I'm the person who ends up getting convicted, I'm sure, you know, there's a mugshot, et cetera, anyway. But, like, the child, where would that be stored? Like, could somebody get a warrant from you to get the child's picture or might it show up in some database later on? Or like, let's say the child is not, maybe this is not an issue now, but maybe the child is not um, a citizen and you're required to turn over photos. Yeah, no. No, all of our stuff is stored on a secure server. Um, no one has access to it. Um, and for uh, identifying purposes, the only thing we use on images is the hash value of the image. So the actual image isn't even shared anywhere. Um, and no data or identifying data could be obtained from that. Thank you. So, so if we're trying to find out if an image has been uh, shared and is out kind of in the wild being shared by people, um, the only thing that we have to share to be able to figure that out is the hash value, which is just the um, uh, digital signature of the file. It has nothing about the identity of the person involved, um, you know, any information about that. It can be used to identify any electronic file. Um, but no, that, that would not be obtainable by anybody. And we're very protective of these images because obviously <laughs> illegal uh, content and, um, and for protection of the victims in these cases. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tom. Thank you. Good morning, Commander. Good to see you. Hi, nice to see you. Um, 
So there's facial recognition and you, you mentioned something else as far as a type of facial recognition? No, it's, it's just a different level. It's facial detection. I was just explaining oh. the difference. Facial detection is, is uh, a tool that can just say, is there a human face present, right? Not, it, not is there a particular human present, but right. human faces. Just like, you, you know, a lot of forensic tools, you can say, are, are there animals present? You know, like, is there movement in any of these videos? Is there, are there human faces? Um, and then facial detection is what we're talking about today, which is a particular face, which uses biometric data across the face to identify a particular face against all others. Right. So would, would the other type, would that, would that be used to determine between an actual human and a uh, anime? Because there's some pretty good anime out there. That's what, that's what went through my mind. Yeah, no. The difference no. between the, those. Yeah, it's, I've never been, never heard of it being used that Okay. Way. Uh, that that's kind of what went through my mind. So, I mean, to the lay person, as as you probably gathered, that I was pretty shocked by the by the language in this. I wasn't ready for it. But I, I guess you know, uh, I, I, overall, I don't have an issue with it. I guess now that I've heard your explanation, but but I would I would like some myself. I would like some kind of defining language that that it's more understandable that these things, you know, if you, if it did get uh, expanded to the sexual assault, homicide, or kidnapping, uh, that's for me anyway, that it's a little more understandable that it's coming from the child exploitation, um, you, you know, uh, uh, world, I guess, and not because the way I read that it's just sexual assault, it's homicide, and it's kidnapping, period. And, and it looks really broad to me. And again, uh, I guess, you know, w with the lawyers in the room, I, I would like, I would just like language that is uh, more specific that it, it is uh, uh, sexual assault, homicide and kidnapping as it pertains to the uh, sexual exploitation of children. Uh, I would be a lot more comfortable with that. Okay, thank you. I don't know if um, David or Matt, if you want to respond to that, or Michelle. Uh, I um, I agree with Tom. Uh, it is very broad, and it and it doesn't. You don't need the premise of an investigation into sexual exploitation of children in order for that. It's just a it's just a broad group. I mean, you can narrow it down. I guess maybe a question I would have for David is um, whether or not if you're, if you're doing a criminal investigation into sexual exploitation of children and then it leads to another discovery of another crime, is that not still, you know, looking at the language here, you know, related to that specific investigation having to do with sexual exploitation? Um, I mean, I can certainly work on the language to narrow it if that's the committee's desire is to have it focused on that, but um, it is it is written very broadly. Yeah, th thank you, Michelle. Uh, David? Uh, yes, uh, David Chair of the Attorney General's Office for the record. Uh, I, I think we can work on something along the lines of what the committee is getting at. I mean, I think what I'm hearing is that you want to have something that makes it clear that these are investigations that originate with uh, child sexual exploitation. Um, and then with the understanding that sometimes that opens out into investigations that include other serious offenses. And I think we could write that in a way that clarifies that these are investigations that are originating from uh, investigations related to child sexual exploitation. I, I, I don't, I certainly don't have specific language now, but I think that that concept could be embodied without limiting um, the effect. I, I think that's kind of what I'm looking for. I'd be real interested in seeing the language because my, my, I mean, I, uh, with this facial recognition, I kind of had blinders on, you know, you know originally that, that this was an ICAC bill, period. 
And, and of course, with this language, uh, as I've already said, it, it does uh, it does branch out. And uh, but but anyway, I would be real interested in some language uh, to narrow it up considerably. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Barbara. Understood. And I, and I think, uh, you know, the intention certainly is that it is an ICAC bill. And then we're trying to encompass the things that ICAC does. But I, but I, I understand, I take the point, and I think we can write the language in a way that uh, encompasses that point. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, and I think I would feel comfortable if it went further to say, um, I mean, because you wouldn't want it to be like, hey, we don't have access to use recognition unless it's an ICAC bill. So this could be an ICAC bill. Let's bring these cases over here and they originate that way. I mean, the, the moratorium was put up for a reason and I think it's important that we address the issue. It can't just be in limbo for years. Um, so I guess I'd want to know like how, like some protective guardrails so that it really isn't just a little way to use it in other venues um, by thinking it could be an ICAC case. Yeah, thank you. Um, David, if you. Sure, and I, I'd give the same answer. I mean, I think we can try to uh, craft a language that makes clear the origination issue, which is what I'm hearing. I, I think what I'm hearing, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, from the committee members that it's a, it's a question about where these where the usage is originating in. Um, and I think we can work on something like that and still allow the investigations to, to uh, look at everything they need to look at to protect people. Great, thank you. Uh, Bob. Yes, thank you. Uh, Commander Raymond, Matt, how you doing? Good, thank you. Not being all that familiar with, with this, this uh, technology and so on and so forth, is it my understanding that you're gonna limit this to media within uh, telephones and, and laptop and so on and so forth and the same uh, technology would not be used to, to gather information from say cameras or monitors were, that were placed in a public venue where there's no expectation of privacy? Correct, this would be just about, uh, as it's written, just about media that was seized pursuant to the investigation that was legally seized. So if, um, you know, currently, if we take a computer, a laptop, a thumb drive, how the forensic tools work is we make a copy of all that data and then that copy is run across the forensic tools all as one aggregate set of data. Um, and so currently, um, just to give an example, we had a case where uh, uh, a child uh, had disclosed that they were sexually assaulted and that the person uh, had taken pictures of it. And it took the examiner six hours to find that video, which would have taken minutes with using the facial detection uh, capabilities that are built into the forensic tools that we use. And again, what to limit what we're only limiting it to looking at the data that we can buy a search warrant. We've already been given judicial authorization to look through. So that examiner can either look through every video, you know, one by one um, and finally find it or use a one tool in there which takes you know minutes or seconds to run across the data and then show us the video that we're looking for so it's it's really about saving hundreds of man hours um because we, we we're going to be able to get to the same result but it was going to take really hundreds or thousands of man hours to get to the same result we have the legal authority already to look at that data um and we can look at it manually one by one or use the tools as they're designed to use to save time and you know we're already woefully understaffed to do this job, and then to add this restriction on it makes it nigh on impossible at this point. Okay, thank you. I just wanted we didn't just open up a, a carte blanche type of situation here. That's all. Yeah, no, we're restricting it to just the data that we already can, <clears throat> we already have the authority to look at. We just want to be able to use this tool against that data. Again, restricting it just to that data, not not searching the web, not, you know, branching out or doing any of that stuff. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go to um, Coach and then uh, Barbara and Tom. Uh, Madam Chair and committee, uh, thank you. And thanks for the indulgence. Um, had three bills to introduce. So I was at a couple of other committees and appropriations. Um, obviously, uh, my concern was very similar to uh, Representative Rachelson's, um, but also um, I stand uh, alongside my fellow representative, Burdett, uh, with a strong, strong uh, uh, commitment to this work. Being that Commander Raymond was very clear and articulate about the usage, the timing, and the technology itself, I would be personally uh, agreeable to hearing language uh, from uh, the AG's office in um, working with our attorney, uh, Michelle, uh, to come up with that language uh, that clearly gives the strength that Commander Raymond needs and the, uh, the strength that we want to maintain in this work. Uh, I just keep going back to that report that Commander gave us at the beginning of COVID and his statistics showing that the rate of incidences went up 419%. That is very, very striking to me and I think to all of us. Uh, so let's get about the work. Uh, if David and uh, Michelle can uh, bring something back to the committee uh, that meets you know, those concerns, the guardrails, but also gives uh, Commander Raymond uh, the strength that he needs to protect our children. You know, I'm, I'm with you. Just needed to say that. Thank you. Thank you. And um, actually, I'm going to go to Michelle because I'm sure I see your, your hand is up and then um, Barbara and Tom. I just, thanks. I just wanted to ask a follow up with respect to Bob's question around um, like public camera, security cameras, things like that. So um, do you, and I just, I just don't know, but so do you not get warrants to, uh, to obtain and review video footage from uh, those type from, you know, something like that, like, like a business's security camera or things like that. I'm just trying to understand because uh, Bob had expressed a concern about you know, something where you're kind of capturing a lot of images of people who may not be aware and coming in and out. So I'm just trying to make sure that the language is is uh, reflected that way. Yeah, no, we never have actually. Obviously the crimes that we're looking at happen in private, very private areas um, because it's usually somebody sexually assaulting a child. Um, so no, we're not. And again, we're not using this to, um, as it was traditionally used, facial recognition to identify people in a crowd or, or, um, or identify unknown individuals. It's really identifying known individuals across a device, a set of seized data that we have. That's our intention uh, of what we want to be able to do, if that makes sense. Sure. David, do you do you have any thought? Do you kind of get what I, I'm just wondering if the the language is narrow enough to, I mean, understand that in practice you may not do that. I'm just wondering about on what it says that um, media legally seized by law enforcement in relation to the specific investigation. Um, yeah, I, think I, guess, that. I guess my my concern is that if the committee's will is that. You don't want taking, you know, like a a security camera video at a at a 
subway stop or something like that, that, that we make sure that that's clear in here. Yeah, I think I can think a little more about that. And my initial response would be that to some degree, I think that concern would be ameliorated by the change we've already contemplated, saying that these are going to be limited to investigations that originate in child exploitation investigations. Uh, in other words, because of the nature of those investigations, which Matt just talked about, uh, you're very unlikely, but maybe you never really look at that type of media. Um, I could see how if it isn't limited to that type of investigation that uh, you then could get into the type of um, you know, broader look, or not broader, but you know, look at a camera or something like that uh, that you're talking about. So I think to some degree it might be ameliorated by that change, um, given the nature of the crimes that are sparking these investigations. Um, and we can think about uh, if there needs to be additional language, I think that's one key way that we can limit it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Barbara and Tom. So I think my first question is for David, which is how, how is, what's the definition for accepting a case as a or actually, I, I guess it could be for either of you, accepting a case. Like, is it that there's probable cause or, or what for um, an ICAC investigation case? Matt, I think you should t talk about the practice. So as we're talking about it in here, um, when we get a warrant to search for the devices, we actually get it under the authority of title uh, of chapter 64, it says right in there, like to search devices for evidence of child exploitation under title, uh, you know, chapter 64, title 13. Um, and if so you don't find any, what happens? Then you just close the case? Well, in that case, obviously that's a probable cause level just to get back to your original question. So that okay, would, sorry. we would have to show a judicial officer that we have probable cause to investigate a crime of child exploitation. Um, and then, um, yeah, so obviously at the end of the day, usually by that point, you know, typically in almost every case, we already have um, child exploitation provided to us usually by uh, an uh, electronic service provider that we've matched up to somebody by the time that we're seizing their devices. So we've already, we've already found child exploitation at that point. So this, bill would only apply to not the people where you went in to see, but the people where you then went to court after with your probable cause. Meaning the suspects? Yes. Yes. So if, if the three people that you, if you go in and there is not information, but you discover that one robbed a bank, would this bill apply to them or not? Well, obviously it would depend on how it's rewritten because currently right. I understand that there's the, the will is to rewrite it so that it has to stem. And, the, and originally, uh, I'll be honest, that's how it was, the original language was. And I brought up the concern, and obviously I'm not an attorney, um, but I brought up the concern, like what happens when we, because we do have cases where it branches from, you know, the, the regular images or videos to, um, you know, active sexual assault investigations um, or in, in uh, kidnapping or murder investigations. Like, well, then where does the line drawn on when we can use facial recognition? You know, like once it's elevated to now that we're, now that it could be a possible kidnapping or a, a murder, then can we still use it at that point? Um, you know, that, that was the question I had. And obviously that will depend on how the language is drafted to fix that. Right. Um, the, other, the other sort of concern that I have is I can think of so many examples and this isn't gonna be in the bill, I hope, I mean, as a finding, but I can think of so many examples where if we allowed particular technologies, we could save law enforcement tons of hours. Like, but we don't necessarily want to do that because we you know, don't want to change 
privacy um, drastically. So I appreciate that it is like it can save hours and hours of work, but I think that's a dangerous um, factor for us to consider um, because as I said, that that's wide open where that wouldn't be the case. And I would hate to have us now have lots of law enforcement coming in here saying, oh, but this will save us 200 hours. Just let us fly the drone, you know, in somebody's window or what, whatever it is, you know, or um, so. So I just felt the need to say that. Well, just a comment on that. This is something that's been it's part of, first of all, it's part of forensic tools that are extremely expensive. And the only ones that have it in Vermont is, is our ICAC. We, we, we purchase it and maintain it for Vermont so that nobody else has this capability in Vermont, to be honest with you, um, for law enforcement. Second of all, this is something that's been going on for years. So it's not your, the moratorium changed something, added hours to law enforcement. We're not, we're not coming to you and asking to use something new that we've never used before. This has, was going on for years and years and there has not, you know, I don't know of one documented case of misuse um, or, and I don't think anybody can point to one. This is something, again, we were using just as a filter for information. It's not hurting anybody's privacy because we can literally thumb through each image and video one at a time. And so we're gonna see much more by doing that than by using the technology, which we're now limiting our scope of view. Otherwise I could put somebody in a room and hit next on every image and literally look at the same set of data one by one manually. Um, so you're not protecting anybody's data by keeping this up on this, in this, in this instance. There's Thank zero, you. zero protection. Thank you very much, that's helpful, thanks. Okay, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Commander, my, my worry isn't, you, you know, with you folks misusing more than it is the reliability of facial recognition and the potential there. Uh, I, I, I don't worry about the misuse so much. And, uh, and just because, you know, knowledge that, you know, we all have now and, and what I believe is uh, it, and, and know in ICAC investigations uh, from what I've what I think I know and what I've seen that criminal charges aren't brought forward until it's uh, pretty much beyond a reasonable doubt, you know, and, and uh, with the investigations that, that you people do. But um, so, so say we, we do pass this, you can do the facial recognition. And, and again, I, I know how uh, uh, ICAC is, for lack of a better word, I guess, the, the way you, you know, again, the way you people almost double check everything. So if you found a, if you found say, uh, whether it was uh, photos of an accused or, or of a, a, a victim, that type of thing, would you have, or do you have anything in place for like a double check um, just to make sure that the, uh, the facial recognition did do the job it's intended to do? Yes. Uh, so at the end of the day, we're really just using it as a filter because you can imagine on anybody's computer, um, imagine every icon that you see on a computer is, a, is an image. That's exactly what it is uh, when you're looking at a computer forensically. So, uh, you know, right out of the gate uh, at, at factory settings, every computer has, you know, hundreds of thousands of images on it just coming to you and then everything that the person loads on it. So we're using this as a filter to try to filter down the information. But at the end of the day, it's a human investigator that's looking at the data and saying, you know, it's really just filtering down to a finite set. And then you're saying, is this, is this a child, is this a child being sexually assaulted? And is this the same child? Um, and that's left to the actual human to make that decision. All the, there have been horrendous uses with um, facial recognition, but it's always been in the trying to identify a suspect and, not, not, not what we're talking about. Just you know, filtering images in a child exploitation case and trying to, trying to figure out uh, who's the victim and 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 you know, like where the images are on the device. It's it's where they have a suspect. They run it against some like Clearview AI, 
um, and it spits back a person, potentially this person. And then the investigator's like, yep, it's that person and runs with it and does no groundwork to verify, is it really this person? And that, that's the horrendous uses of it. And that's not what we want to do. Um, you know, we were, we were approached like every ICAC by Clearview AI and asked, do, do you want to try our product? And I said, no, um, you know, I didn't think Vermonters would stand for that. And we didn't want to be participating in any of that. So we don't want to go in that direction. Right. It's really just, just uses a filter. And at the end of the day, it's, it's the human investigator that's making the decision, you know, like, yes, this is his child and he's sexually assaulting her. Right. Yeah. That, that was my guess is that you were, doing, you know, I guess what, what I call the double check, but um, right. it's, it's good to hear you say that. And, um, oh, let's see. I, I guess, I don't even understand my own note for the most part, but <laughs> um, it, it was talked about earlier as far as restrict, let, let me, give me just a second. I'm going to have to come back to that, I guess, <laughs> figure out what I meant. But uh, as far as the forensic work you do, uh, are, there's just the two of you, if I remember right, uh, in your office, uh, other than I know you branch out to other uh, departments, but whatever. But are, uh, are, are you uh, certified in the forensics? It, we utilize, there's four state police detectives that do a lot of forensic works for us. Oh, okay. um, yeah. And they're the, like the for, forensic wing for us. And um, then you got myself and Jesse Sawyer from the AG's office. Um, and, uh, but yes, I've gone through uh, forensic training. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's all I have for now. <laughs> Great. Now this is really helpful. Uh, Selena. Um, I, ap I apologize if my question is a little bit redundant. I've been had to be just a little in and out of this hearing this morning um, at times. But so uh, like from everything I've heard you say, it really sounds like you're really talking exclusively about victim identification and not suspect in the, your workflows here. Yeah, we're not, uh, typically we've already identified the suspect. Um, we're, and again, we've, we're, we're looking at this, we're looking through the suspect's uh, devices, right? Their, their information. Uh, but sometimes we would need to search by uh, using facial detection, uh, facial recognition of the suspect's image. Okay. So if he's sexually assaulted a child and videoed himself doing it and say his face is, is visible in the video. Um, so then it's reasonable to assume he's, there, there could be more. And so then you would also search by the person's image across the device to see if there's, because uh, if it's a different child, obviously it wouldn't come up by searching by that child. But if by the suspect, you would then search using his. But again, it's not using it to identify the suspect. You're just trying to identify the, the videos, um, it typically nowadays it's videos, not images, um, of sexual assault of a child. Um, yeah, and so I'm, I'm just thinking a little bit about how um, we could narrow things and um, listening to you talk, I wonder if there's some language about acknowledging like an identified suspect or something like that. Um, uh, and I really appreciated um, Representative Richelson's remarks about sort of, you know, like there's a lot of technologies and techniques we could use in law enforcement that save time. And the understanding of that is a slippery slope. And I would also note that I think, you know, childhood sexual abuse and exploitation is, a, is an extreme example of a crime where time is of the essence. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about how some of the practical ways the moratorium has affected your work and if there have been um, instances where it really did result in a child being potentially in harmful situations for significantly longer periods of time. Yeah, so... Uh it's really hard to answer that question because we have such a backlog now 
and I'm not saying it's all caused by this, but we have such a backlog that's been exacerbated by this, that um, there's a lot of unknowns in that, right? So we have, in that one case I already explained where uh, we found that he was, uh, we'd already gone and arrested the guy for trading on kick, child sexual uh, videos of involving infants and toddlers. And then it was by the time we examined his devices, we found out he was actually sexually assaulting his um, two-year-old daughter himself. And then we were able to remove the daughter from that situation. Um, so in that case, if you look at that compared to our cases now, when there's a backlog um, of getting stuff examined um, and then we don't know, like, right? Because right? some of these cases haven't gotten to the full exam yet. So there could be victims in there that we have not identified. Um, and so, uh, the sooner a victim is identified, the sooner a victim gets services, the better outcomes of their for their life. Um, and so the you know time is of the, the essence in this. And again, we're um, we're not asking to use a new technology. A lot of people are thinking this is like something new we want to be able to do. This is something we have traditionally been doing, time and time again. All you know, that's how we did every case, um, and it was the moratorium that changed things. And again, if you look at the thousands and thousands of cases we've done, um, there's not been one complaint or one issue with us using it this way. You know, we're not using it to, to identify people or misidentify people. And in that case, we're using it really just as a filter of data that we have legally seized. And again, can page through every image one at a time and eventually get to the same, same scenario. Um, so. I'd just like to point that out that this is something that we've done for years and years with no issues. Thank you. Oh, that was really helpful. Thank you. Commander, I think I can pose my question now. <laughs> uh, and, and it's not really, I guess it's not really a question for you, but maybe uh, for Michelle and David or, and the committee is, it was brought up a couple times about um, other information or other videos or uh, uh, security cameras and that type of thing. And, and it, it kind of, it does say it in the bill that, you know, that you are restricted uh, to electronic uh, media legally seized by law enforcement. But I, I didn't, I mean, to me that, that, that says only, you know, the, the stuff that you got by warrant, but I, I just didn't, again, I'm thinking out loud, I just didn't know if maybe it needed to be a little clearer and maybe even say that it, it uh, other uh, um, videos or security cameras and that thing, type of thing can't be used. Um, but, but anyway, I'm kind of thinking out loud. Um, is, is there any other questions for uh, Commander Raymond? Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Yep. Um, oh, okay. Uh, uh, David, I think, is up next. But okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank Thank you very much. Thanks to the committee for taking this up. Uh, again, David Chair uh, with the Attorney General's Office. For the record, um, a lot of the key points we've actually gone over in this first discussion, so I don't want to take up too much time unnecessarily. But I did want to make a couple, uh, a few key points, one overarching point about how we approach this legislation and then a couple specific points about the legislation just to emphasize some of the what's there um, and acknowledge some of the edits we might make or one of the edits we might make going forward. Um, the overarching point is that the Attorney General's office really approaches this issue uh, and approach this bill from a place of great skepticism and concern about the overuse of facial recognition technology. Um, you know, our office sued Clearview AI uh, to stop some of their uses of internet scraping data and then trying to resell that um, uh, to anybody who might. Obviously, they approached uh, ICAC. We don't know who else they may have approached, either law enforcement or, or commercial or private entities of, of various kinds. Um, so, you know, we're in an active um, legal fight against that type of facial recognition, which is just unknowing, you know, without people's consent, without even their knowledge, just scraping the internet for 
uh, images and then trying to uh, essentially use that for very broad based unlimited surveillance. Um, again, that's something that we are uh, against and we are actively working against. In drafting this legislation, we actually consulted with one of the lawyers who's working on that case to make sure that we aren't uh, accidentally edging over into the type of uh, usage of this technology that we don't want to engage in and that we are, uh, again, actively fighting against. With respect to this particular legislation, I just wanted to emphasize that there are three protections built into it. Um, as a way of thinking about it conceptually. The most important protection, I think, is the one at the end, uh, which is limiting it to electronic media legally seized by law enforcement. Uh, and that means either through a warrant or, or by consent, um, if somebody were to be approached and, and voluntarily turn over, um, turn over data, turn over devices. Obviously, they don't have to do that. And then we would have to get a warrant to obtain that data. Um, that itself is a tremendous limitation and uh, really pulls that itself pulls this out of that world of sort of unlimited views of whatever information might be out there that we could apply this technology to. It's important to emphasize that anything that we obtain through either of those mess through either of those means either consent or warrant if, and I Commander Raymond, correct me if, my, if I'm wrong, but my senses were really usually talking about warrants here. Um, any information we obtain through that means is, is, is information, images, videos that law enforcement is going to have whether or not this bill passes. It's information that law enforcement is going to look through whether or not this bill passes. Uh, so this is not an expansion. This is not using technology to expand what law enforcement can look at or what law enforcement will look at. It's law enforcement can and will look at these images in order to do the things that Commander Raymond talked about, protecting victims, finding if there are other um, victims involved with a particular perpetrator. Um, so these investigations, these images are, are going to be looked at anyway. This is not an expansion of, of what would happen regardless of whether this is this is passed. The second protection that's built in is limiting it to um, an image of an individual the law enforcement believes to be a victim, potential victim, or suspect. So we are talking about uh, individuals that are already known to law enforcement, saying that if you have somebody who you believe fits in these three categories, um, then you can look for that person in the images, but it has to be an individual who they've already developed a belief about. Um, that's sort of the second protection. And the third protection is the category of offenses that we're talking about. I will acknowledge plainly, I, I think that that is probably at this point, the least protective of the protections, the least restrictive of the restrictions. And I think that we can redraft that slightly to make that a little bit more restrictive and make it clear that we're talking about investigations that originate with the ICAC task force um, and make that a little bit of a more restrictive restriction. But those are the three points that I wanted to make about the particular bill that uh, we really are talking about a very limited uh, set of cases, very limited use case, very limited um, instances in which they're going to be used. And again, the time-saving argument is not, I understand the time-saving argument could be used in a plethora of ways that we would not actually want it to be used and that could violate civil liberties. Uh, but that's not the case here. We're really talking about um, images that are going to be possessed by law enforcement by virtue of these investigations. Um, and that uh, will be looked at by law enforcement anyway. Um, so it's a really limited use case that does not expand law enforcement's purview or ability uh, to review uh, information or, or images. Anyway, that, those are my three points. I think some of those were covered a, a little bit before. Don't, don't mean to be repetitive, but just wanted to emphasize the sort of construct that we're working with here uh, and the general attitude that we're approaching this with, which is a very we're trying to be limited here and we're happy to work with the committee to make sure that's the case. Great, thank you. No, I appreciate that and certainly look forward to, to new language. Uh, Tom. 
And, and that's, thank you. That's exactly what I was going to say as I'm looking forward to the new language that'll, but to, to lay person that it, it's, uh, that it's clear that it's, it's narrower, much narrower, but and, and one thing I, I'm really glad to hear, David, as far as your office goes is, is uh, and maybe I've heard it before, but your skepticism on uh, facial recognition and, uh, you know, and your hesitation on, on the use of it. Um, so I think maybe it was discussed a little more than I heard, but uh, early, so say if uh, you know, the bill passes, you know, Everybody likes it. It's narrow, uh, that type of thing. And I think was there some talk about possibly some language if another crime was was found? Because just just as an example, uh, there's an investigation, you know, on the uh, exploitation of children, and um, and for whatever reason, a a murder ha is seen in it. So what would happen in a case like that? Or if it, again, if it was said, I apologize, but, or if a, a, uh, obvious uh, uh, evidence that a bank robbery was, was, uh, was done, um, that type of thing. Uh, so how, how would an investigation or could an investigation expand into, into that? So I, I can answer that one. So as part of all of our warrants, we have a section in there that says if we uncover evidence, like we're looking for evidence of child exploitation, but inadvertently we could uncover something else. Sure. Uh, so we have a section that says if that happens, we stop the exam and apply for a second warrant. Obviously that second warrant wouldn't be under child exploitation at that point. It would be, we would have then have like two searches, right? The child exploitation search. And then if we had uncovered you know, that someone videoed themselves doing an armed robbery. We've not uncovered that, but I'm just throwing out. Right, a, no, I understand. Yeah. Um, then we would stop the investigation, right? Stop the exam, apply for a secondary warrant to examine it for the armed robbery. In that armed robbery case, we then obviously under, you know, the new language we don't have yet, but that is to come, we wouldn't be able to use it under that law, under that okay. investigation. Okay. Oh, that's great. That so, that, so then if you did apply for the other warrant, then, then you could uh, search the devices for that information, potentially. Right. And, and I'm going to guess uh, maybe even that warrant may cover a residence to see if you could go find evidence there too. Yeah, um, we, would, we would hand that and we would do the exam and then hand the information off to somebody else because we don't have- Oh, enough, right. We don't have enough resources to do the child exploitation. So we're not going to follow up on- bank robberies we would then we would provide that information to somebody else and they would run with it but right, um, right but yeah but that would that would show the protection of using the facial recognition in that case the second warrant wouldn't be about child exploitation right and then from say if that did happen and you handed it off to uh, whatever division or you know other detectives um from there they wouldn't be able to use facial recognition. Correct. Right, okay. Great, thank you. Thank if, you. if I might just add to that briefly, um, the practice that Commander Raymond talks about is also based in um, uh, legal restrictions around warrants. Uh, and although I was, didn't come here today fully prepared to do a, a lecture on um, Fourth Amendment search warrant law, it, you know, it is the case that warrants have to name the evidence that they intend to find in the place that they are looking for it. Um, so that's why out of uh, it, making sure that they're, that, that the uh, they're not trying to later use in court evidence that could be knocked out because they didn't have a proper warrant to seize it. That's why you go back and say, okay, now we have probable cause to believe that this other evidence, which we weren't originally, which we didn't originally get a warrant for, but now we have probable cause to believe this other evidence um, may be found in the place that we are looking to seize it. And so we're going back to get this other warrant to say, uh, now we want to look for this other evidence and we have probable cause to leave this other evidence about another offense uh, it will be found in the place that we're searching for it. So anyway, that was just a brief little uh, overview about the legal protections that lead to that practice that uh, the commander was talking about. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Coach and then Tom. 
Madam Chair, I, I think um, uh, David just uh, clarified um, uh, the question uh, that I was um, uh, going to, and, and Tom's question led into that, uh, because I was looking uh, back at some of the uh, uh, the original discussions that we had had, you know, over the years around uh, the reliability, you know, of recognition, especially uh, for people of color. Uh, and, uh, you know, it hasn't really been resolved. Uh, the, uh, uh, the National Institute uh, that is uh, responsible for uh, that technology at the federal level uh, is where uh, that resides and they're not comfortable yet uh, with the technology. So um, I think your point is well taken, especially around the, uh, the warrant. Uh, they're very clear, very specific, and you know that, that helps me a lot. Thank you. Great, good, thank you, uh, Tom. Last, last one, I promise. <laughs> so, David, you kind of piqued my interest as far as warrants go. So, how detailed is a warrant? Say, say it's a the bank robbery case uh, discovered through an ICAC investigation, and you uh, you needed a warrant to see if you could find evidence um, of a bank robbery. I, I guess would be the terminology to use, but, but how detailed would it, would it be as far as what evidence you're looking for? And maybe the commander would uh, be better to answer that. I don't know. I, I certainly defer to the, how the command, he's the one who, who writes the warrants in these cases. Right. So I defer to him how he does that for these cases. I mean, I can tell a little bit more about the general standards and I can say that sometimes these become litigated points. Was the evidence that ultimately was seized sufficiently described in the warrant. Um, okay. And I don't actually, there is like a legal standard that I'm forgetting right now about, um, you know, just how specific it, it needs to be. But I'll, I'll def the commander will have an answer for you in terms of a, these specific warrants. Right. So uh, again, usually we're getting our search warrants to search a residence uh, for devices. So there's a two part warrant, basically one is you can search this location being the residence, right? Um, for this specific evidence. And in that case, it is, we're searching for electronic devices capable of storing electronic media. Um, and then searching those devices for evidence of the uh, sexual exploitation of children being specifically videos depicting child sexual abuse material or videos or images depicting child sexual abuse materials. So it's very, very specific and has to be specific and narrowly tailored to the investigation. And then in other cases, it may be um, that we have to search for if, if our original a video that led us somewhere was a sexual assault and we think that person made it and there's other stuff depicted in the video, um, like unique clothing or um, something that would uh, identify, um, then we would, we would have to add that to the warrants. So you have to be very specific about what you're searching for. So no matter, no matter what the department, then, uh, warrants are pretty specific then. Yes. Yeah. They have to be, or they'd be legally challenged and you sure. would the evidence and wouldn't be able to use it as part of the proceeding. Hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, not seeing any other hands? Um, okay, well, this is really helpful. Thank you. Um, I really did want to just get the bill out there, uh, more of an introduction. Uh, and uh, when we do take it up again, which I hope we will soon, once we you know, get some more language together, then I will ask um, ACLU to, to join and, uh, and to testify. And uh, great, well, thank you, appreciate it. So we are going to adjourn uh, until 1.15 after lunch.